soft warehouses in the Derbyshire region. And I got one favorable response and it was the fact on core design. When I walked into the building, I had no idea they were a games company. So it was to my great surprise that that's what they did. So I really enjoyed my time there. Obviously we did two later there, of course, amongst many other titles. In 1998, I kind of had enough of Tomb Raider. Uh, I've done three of those titles, um, but I wanted to go out and try a few other things. So I set up my own company, Mio Productions, and one of the clients I worked for was indeed the Spice Girls. They called me for the Mega Drive. And that really started my career as a composer in games. I never did another single bit of programming ever again. CD games, Swagman, Blam Machine Head, Heimdall, um, and along came Tomb Raider. For me, this was just another game. We were, we were producing quite a few games each year, certainly about 12 a year, uh, but there were periods where we were actually making music and sounds for games inside a week, which was a ridiculous workload, and many of us never left core design for weeks and weeks on end. Um, the boss was pretty hard on us, and he would. I remember once he came down to my office and he said, "You've got a week to do this game. Don't leave the office until it's done. If you do, you know where the door is." This was his catchphrase: "You know where the door is." <laughs> so it was a really big threat. You know, here was me with a full-time job as a music composer. The last thing I wanted to do was lose that job. So we did everything that Jeremy told us to do. So developing the music for Tomb Raider, I literally had four weeks to put all that together. And if any of you know Tomb Raider, hopefully some of you do, it's a big game. It's a long, long game. If you play it from start to finish, it's many hours of, of, of playtime. And to paint a load of music on top of that game actually requires a huge amount of music. And there was no way I was going to be able to cover that game in four weeks. Implementation time was also ridiculously short. I remember I finished the music, or as much as I could, on the Friday of a particular week. And the game was due for release on Monday. And none of the triggers had been laid in the game. The game was still silent in terms of music. I went home Friday night and said to Jeremy, look, call me over the weekend, as soon as you're ready for me to lay the triggers, give me a ring, I'll come straight back in and we'll, we'll, we'll go through the game, we'll lay as many triggers as we can. Well, I never got that phone call. When I came in on Monday, I'm like, what happened, what happened? You know, are, are we ready? Can we put the triggers in now? He said to me, oh, it's gone. I'm like, what do you mean it's gone? Yeah, it's gone into submission. I'm like, you're joking. So all the work which I had done, the triggers had been laid by somebody else. So, so if anyone wants to complain about why did that piece of music play there? It wasn't my fault. So I ended up actually only writing seven cues for the game, seven pieces of music. And it was in fact Toby Gard, I'll point the finger, who laid the triggers. Um, and what he did, in fact, because he only had seven pieces of music and he, he needed more, he cut many of my tunes in half, some of them into three pieces and triggered the separate fragments in different places. So, you know, you get a tune like Where the Depths Unfold, it actually comes in three parts, and it's played in, each part is played in a different place in the game. And that happened to several of the pieces. So, you know, that was quite difficult for me to stomach, but nonetheless, we have to move forward. <laughs> so, because of the tiny amount of music that was in there, there are long periods in the game where there's no music at all. You're literally just listening to sound effects. And a lot of the time, the only sound effect that you can hear is Lara's footsteps. Mm -hmm. So it is very, very minimal. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. The triggering system that we had was really basic. If you imagine this floor cut up into a grid, like a big chessboard. Twice as much time, but still very little, only eight weeks. Implementation this time was seven days, 
And this time I was laying the triggers. So I was in charge of now where those pieces of music were being laid and how they were happening. So I was much more comfortable with that. We had 27 cues this time. So a huge, number, a huge increase in the number of tracks. Um, and I had learned from Toby's, you know, uh, heart chopping <laughs> of my pieces of music in half, that actually smaller cues were favorable. So I basically wrote the music, you know, all the, all the tracks were much, much shorter, 30 seconds, 20 seconds, something like this, instead of three minutes. And this helped us reduce these long periods where there was no music. But of course I had to think a little bit more carefully about why a piece of music happened and, and, and when to trigger it. So the triggering system, we, we pushed that forward a little bit. We uh, expanded on the functionality a little bit. And now it wasn't just Lara that could walk on a music trigger, enemies could walk on them as well. So it meant that Lara could step on a trigger that triggered an enemy. The enemy would come running around the corner and just as he ran around the corner, he would stand on the music trigger. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, here's the enemy. So again, that gave us better control over how the music would describe the action. And it was becoming more interactive. We were, in fact, in, in fact developing an interactive music system, albeit we didn't really kind of Three months, that. not too bad. Get a few more tunes done. Implementation was getting a bit longer. Okay, so I had two weeks now to kind of lay all those triggers. So I spent a lot more time with the level designers talking about how things were happening, why things happened, when they happened. And I was able to kind of describe that using, uh, you'll see in a minute, improved tree ring system <laughs> to kind of, again, just detail what was happening um, a, bit, a bit better. I had 50 cues of music now. And again, the durations were getting smaller and smaller because I realized that in actual fact, I only needed just a few seconds of saying something musically to describe what was happening. There was no point having dun 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 music if you shot the guy within five seconds. So again.
where the series was going to go. How much, how much were you given when you were composing the music? Like, were you given like visuals of, of what you were writing to, or very, more, more of an idea? Very little for Tomb Raider One. Um, for many of the games, sort of previous to, to Tomb Raider One, also I didn't get to see much of the game because you know we were brought onto the project such a late stage. Um, there wasn't really time, you know, to 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 look at the game very much. But but with Tomb Raider, I really focused my questions to him on the character of Lara Croft, who she was, where she came from, what she liked, what she didn't like, the kind of things that she would say when she would blow somebody's head off and when she wouldn't, you know, all this kind of thing, because I wanted to understand her as a person. You can listen to it, but in fact, it's there so we can...